you're good to go. I'm good to go. Yeah. All right. So um, welcome everyone to the second meeting um, of our summer session. Today we have Alan Legg from Purdue University Fort Wayne, and Alan will tell us about logarithmic equilibrium on the sphere in the presence of multiple point charges. As usual, after the talk, there'll be time to discuss it and to socialize a little bit. So, Alan, please. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to talk. And I'm excited to talk about this problem because when I first came to Purdue Fort Wayne, it just kind of fell out of the sky. I'm a complex analyst. I worked with Steve Bell at the main campus of Purdue. And when I moved here, I got in touch with Peter Drognev, and it turns out that somehow our two worlds collided perfectly. So this is going to be a, a nice integration of some complex analysis and some potential theory, uh, hopefully not too out there or difficult, but uh, it was a demonstration of of how you can kind of elegantly tie these things together and answer some new questions. Uh, and as I said, this is joint work with Peter Drognev, and we're going to be building on a paper uh, by Brauchart, Drognev, Saf, and Wamersley from 2018 about the sphere. So we're going to use the sphere in R3 as the setting for a familiar problem from potential theory, which is the minimal energy or equilibrium distribution problem. So we're going to imagine placing kind of a fluid charge onto a conductor, in this case a sphere, that's free to rearrange itself to obtain minimal energy, and in the presence also maybe of an external field. Uh, and it's going to be logarithmic interactions as opposed to Coulomb, but you can still kind of import some of your physical intuition. So for example, if you were in the plane and you were on a domain omega, you might imagine how would a sea of like charge spread itself around to obtain minimal energy. And if there's no external field, for example, you might imagine since it's all a like charge, it'll repulse itself as far as possible away and reside on the outer boundary of your domain or your conductor. So to phrase that mathematically, we're going to start with a positive unit Borel measure mu. It's going to act as our charge distribution, so to speak. And we're going to place it onto a valid region, omega closure. And of course, we all know you can then assign a potential to that charge distribution at every point in the plane. It's by integrating uh, your measure against this logarithmic kernel log of one over distance. And that potential comes equipped with an energy. You just integrate the potential everywhere, and you get the logarithmic energy of that particular charge distribution. And then the idea is you go searching through these possible measures and look for the one that minimizes energy. And that's going to be called the equilibrium. Right. So when your conductor has positive logarithmic capacity, uh, then we kind of know what happens. There is a minimal finite energy obtainable. And it's obtained by some mu called the equilibrium measure. And it's unique. And then the next question is, what happens if you activate an external field? So you flip a switch and there's an external electric field. Then, of course, you might expect that that field's going to influence the charge. And it's probably going to distort, if not the density, then maybe even the support of that equilibrium distribution. In fact, that is what happens. Uh, an external field can push on it and move it around. And we want to know what exactly is going to happen in a particular case of a nice external field. All right, so still in the plane so far, uh, if you have what's called an admissible external field, which involves a growth condition at infinity to contain the problem, uh, then there's a theory of equilibrium measures which has similarities to just the plane theory without fields. So for example, there's the classic Saftotic book that most of us probably know about. Uh, but if you do place a unit charge on omega with an admissible external field, uh, then here's how things change. You get weighted versions of both the energy and the potential, and then you again minimize this weighted energy. And so the weighted energy is going to look like this. You've got the same logarithmic energy from before, 
and then a second term that's going to incorporate a contribution of the field interacting with your charge distribution. And if you minimize that, and this is going to be what we're interested in on the sphere in a few minutes. And the basic tool is called the Frostman theorem, which in this case says if you have a nice positive logarithmic capacity conductor, uh, then that minimal energy is again finite and it's obtained by a unique equilibrium measure. And then importantly for us, for some constant, uh, this is the weighted potential. So the plane logarithmic potential plus the field is constant on the support of the equilibrium measure. And it can only get bigger outside of that support, at least quasi everywhere. And again, that's an intuition in action uh, because if there were a potential difference on the support, then physically you'd imagine a current should be flowing to equalize it and again, lower the energy. Uh, so that's again a rigorization of what you'd expect. Uh, and now we're gonna push that same problem onto the sphere S2 in R3. So uh, to belabor the point, the sphere is gonna be the conductor. We're gonna dump a unit positive charge on it. That's gonna redistribute itself to give minimal energy. And we're gonna be still using logarithmic interactions in the presence of an external field. Uh, and as the basic, the other basic tool here is gonna be the stereographic projection. So we're going to take some choice of North Pole and project everything to the plane. And that's going to distort the surface spherical measure into the plane. And it's going to look like Lebesgue area measure dA over 1 plus norm z squared squared. Of course, the North Pole goes to infinity. And using this kind of technique, Brauchart, Dragnev, Saf, and Wamersley were able to determine what happens in a particular case which is an external field of finitely many point charges that are on the sphere, but they're sufficiently weak or separated far enough uh, that something nice happens. So this is paraphrasing them. Uh, if you put a unit charge on the sphere and activate some point charges that are weak, weak enough, then the energy minimizing charge distribution is still gonna be uniform so just like you'd expect by symmetry without an external field, but the density is still uniform everywhere. The only thing that changes is the support gets some parts deleted from it. So each of the point charges you stick on the sphere excludes a spherical cap around it where it sweeps out the charge. Uh, they also extend this to higher dimensions and to some different Reese exponents, uh, but in the 2D, case of stereographic projection, uh, this also works. And you can explicitly calculate the size of the caps. And so we talk about, for example, a cap of influence uh, where the charge gets excluded. The actual support of the equilibrium measure is sometimes called the droplet. So I'm talking about the complement of the droplet here. And if the caps are disjoint, that's exactly what sufficiently weak or separated meant in their result. Uh, so I'm gonna share some images from their 2018 paper. I think these were generated by Wamersley. And so the red is the droplet, the equilibrium support, and the blue is where the charge is being excluded by the yellow dots, which are the point charges. And as you can see, the red dots are pretty uniform and they're avoiding these perfect circular caps. So there's two, there's three points. And even to the point where if you increase the charges and these caps of influence start to collide, they remain circles until they're tangent. And I guess the part of the story that we're gonna be mainly focusing on today is let those charges grow a little bit more. And now all of a sudden these caps are overlapping and we're not filling out all of the space in the complement of these individual caps anymore. So it looks like there's some void region here. And also, there's not really a sharp corner anymore like there was here. It seems to have rounded out. So we want to analyze what exactly is going on there. So some finer views. Definitely looks like it's kind of smoothing out into a lobe shape, which we're going to try to classify. 
So almost in motion there. I guess I'm imagining two point charges increasing in charge until these caps overlap. And I want some analytic or geometric description of what that new equilibrium measure is going to be. But thankfully, there's kind of a pre-laid path for us if we think about the plane. Uh, if you take two circles, flat circles, and combine them at a potential theoretically and smooth them into a single curve, then that kind of makes you think of what's called a Neumann oval, which is a type of quadrature domain, which kind of comes from both real and complex potential theory. Uh, but what I mean by overlap and smooth out is the harmonic mean value theorem. So on a disk, if you integrate a harmonic function, then you'd expect to get some multiple of the value at the center of the disk. A Neumann oval is what happens if you want two nodes in your integral. So if you integrate a harmonic function, you'll get a linear combination of two function values at two separate points. And kind of a similar phenomenon arises. If you crank up the coefficient that you want in that integral formula at two separate points, then the corresponding shape called a quadrature domain that satisfies that uh, integral equals linear combination of values starts as two separate disks. They end up tangent, and then they smooth out into these Neumann ovals. And if you were to continue this figure even further than I took it, they eventually even become convex. And if the charges get high and the points get close, you would essentially approximate just a big disk with a big mass in the center again. And you can do the same thing for any number of nodes you want. And that's called a quadrature domain. So in general, quadrature domains are a little more uh, forgiving than that. You can explain them this way. If you have a given test class, usually harmonic, integrable, Bergman space, that's holomorphic and square integrable, or integrable analytic, et cetera. Uh, you want integration to be a linear combination of point evaluations and maybe even allow derivatives of the test class functions. And if you can find an equation like this, it's called a quadrature identity, where the same nodes and coefficients hold for anything in your test class, then you'd talk about that being a quadrature domain. The number of terms is sometimes called the order, and the evaluation points are sometimes called the nodes of your quadrature domain. And so some basic examples, we just went through the disk and the Neumann oval. If you allow a derivative value for your quadrature identity, you can get limissons and cardioids. And in general, you can overlap disks all over the place and do the right kind of merger to smooth them out uh, with any number of nodes you want. And actually, you can end up approximating any smooth shape you want. There's a theorem that says any smooth C infinity bounded domain in the plane can be smoothly approximated however closely you want by quadrature domains. And so uh, they're everywhere. But the reason a complex analyst would like them, like I do, is because they automatically enjoy a lot of strong properties. And that's kind of how I knew them from before, was take a shape, map it to a quadrature domain nearby, and now you have a similar shape with all of these nice properties. They have algebraic boundary. Uh, proper maps to the disk are algebraic, so like Riemann maps or Alfors maps if you're not simply connected. Uh, if you take a map between any two quadrature domains, they have to be algebraic. The Bergman kernel is algebraic, so that's the reproducing kernel for square integrable holomorphic functions. And they also, importantly for this talk, have a meromorphic Schwartz function. And I'm going to describe what the Schwartz function is here in a second and what role it has to play. Uh, but to kind of put a firm handle on this, in the case of the Neumann oval, uh, that rational map to the unit disk is is the algebraic map that I just mentioned. You can conformally map from the disk to a Neumann oval uh, using a rational function with two poles. And somehow the images of these two poles end up playing a part in the quadrature identity after you map from the disk to the quadrature domain. So they're A, B, C, D, or parameters if you want. And similarly, for a higher number of nodes, the boundary is al always algebraic. Uh, 
and here's the Schwartz function. So if you're given a bounded real analytic curve in the plane, then you might notice that the function z bar conjugation is itself real analytic. So the cauchy kofelevskaya theorem tells you that you can extend z bar to be complex analytic in a little collar, at least, around your analytic curve. And if your real analytic curve happens to be the boundary of a domain, then that means you can take the function z bar and extend it from the boundary inside the domain a little bit in an analytic way. And in that setting, that continuation is called the Schwartz function. And for a generic real analytic curve, you'd expect maybe just a tiny little margin where you can extend. But a quadrature domain is characterized by being a place where you can extend the Schwartz function in all the way throughout the domain, maybe with some poles, actually, hopefully with some poles, or else there's trouble because z bar is not holomorphic. But uh, if you can extend miromorphically throughout the whole domain, then that's equivalent to being a quadrature domain uh, with what, harmonic or Bergman test class. For example, the unit circle, uh, z bar is 1 over z on the boundary, and 1 over z extends inside and has a single pole at the origin, which happens to coincide with the evaluation node of the harmonic mean value theorem. And so it's a similar story for any quadrature domain, and I'll kind of briefly run through why. It's essentially Stokes' theorem. Uh, if you have a miromorphic Schwartz function, then you can imagine integrating an integrable analytic function. And since it's an analytic function, you can rewrite the integral this way. Probably missed a minus sign there. But Stokes' theorem then says you can go to the boundary and drop the d out front. And then the z bar on the boundary is equal to the Schwartz function, which was miromorphic. And so now this just decomposes into a linear combination of evaluations by the residue theorem. And so that's the connection. So back to the problem at hand. When I first got introduced to this problem by Peter, I kind of just naively said that looks like a Neumann oval. And I guess this happens sometimes. That just happened to be the right answer after all. So it was a good intuition. Uh, but this lobed shape is made by taking two circles, the spherical caps, and merging them together in a potential theory way. And so I thought, well, maybe that has something to do with a Neumann oval. And I'm going to try to explain why exactly that is, in fact, true. And there are a couple different approaches. I'm going to kind of go through in some medium amount of detail, an intuitive kind of elegant connection. And that'll involve some boundary smoothness. And I'll tell you how to get around that toward the end. So just for now, uh, the blue region in the picture is where the charge is getting swept clean. I'm going to imagine that that's smooth and simply connected. And just to keep things simple, I'll imagine two points in particular. So I'm going to rotate the sphere so that the north pole is in what would have been the red region in the picture, in the equilibrium support, and then project stereographically. And the Braukhart, Dragnev, Saf, Wormersley paper tells you how to transform the potential theory problem into the plane. Uh, if you rewrite Frostman's condition of having constant weighted potential, then you're going to get uh, the two point charges, their logarithmic potentials, something coming from uh, the equilibrium support, and then some distortion from the projection. So the summary of that is if you get two point charges, which map to Z1 and Z2 in the plane, and they have intensities Q1 and Q2, then this is Frostman's condition of weighted uh, potential being constant for anything in the conductor. So there is maybe a quibble here, which is that projected version of the problem does not involve an admissible external field. But it turns out not to be a disaster because it is what's called weakly admissible. And in a weakly admissible external field, you thankfully can still use Frostman's condition. So this is still going to be true for the domain omega. And so the idea is just knowing that this equation is true, what can we say about this domain omega where it's happening? So to analyze that integral, we're going to 
first bound it because I projected from the North Pole, which was in the red region. So my blue region that I'm analyzing is now bounded. So you can stick that integral in a, a big circle that's going to go off to infinity. And then differentiate in Z and use Green's theorem in the form of the C infinity version of the Cauchy integral formula. So as a complex analyst, I just start pulling out all my favorite tools on it. Uh, and maybe not everyone's seen the C infinity version of the Cauchy integral formula, so I've got it written here. If you have a smooth function up to the boundary instead of holomorphic, then you can write this in terms of a Cauchy integral, like we're all used to for holomorphic functions, and then plus some contribution being integrated on the inside, which involves an anti-holomorphic derivative. So if you take those steps on that Frostman condition from the last slide, and do some algebra, and you can simplify down to this version here. And that turns into a boundary integral of kind of a weighted Cauchy kernel with this spherical area weight out front. And that's a linear combination of two Cauchy kernels uh, at your two projected point charge locations, which almost looks like a quadrature domain because you've got a linear combination of evaluations in Z. And in order to really make this a quadrature identity, you'd want something like this to hold for a whole test class of functions. So I somehow want to elevate this equation from a single function to integrating a wide class of functions. And that's what we're going to start to do now. So that previous formula, you can differentiate that itself in Z. And that'll give you some m's as exponents in the formula. So for any positive integer m, you can track down uh, what happens to the derivatives, and you get this. And then you use partial fractions. So inside the integral here, this says if you put poles outside your domain, then you can add up with a linear combination any rational function you want using partial fractions. and now for any rational function R with poles in the red region outside the charge exclusion region that we're talking about, you can get this. So now we've got a rational function version of that integral identity, which is kind of now a weighted quadrature identity for rational functions. And I wanna push the bill even further to try to get uh, just a plain old quadrature identity and we'll do that by finding a Schwartz function. And it turns out the thing to use is Mergelian's theorem. So complex analyst's other favorite theorem. That rational function R, you can tweak around to uh, uniformly approximate any H and A infinity that you want. So that's smooth holomorphic functions that are smooth up to the boundary using Mergelian's theorem. And then you'll get the same integral identity by uniform uh, convergence. And if you rewrite the two integrals on the right-hand side using Cauchy's formula, because these are holomorphic rational functions, and subtract them to the other side, then you rearrange yourself into here. And so I've got a boundary integral where this rational stuff on the left is now annihilating anything smooth and holomorphic up to the boundary. And so now this is essentially a statement about uh, the Hardy space, because I'm integrating things on the boundary and I have orthogonality. And we know what the structure of the orthogonal complement of the Hardy space on a smooth bounded domain is. Uh, for example, in Bell's book, he tells us that essentially you have to have a holomorphic function integrating on the boundary to give you zero like in Cauchy's theorem. So I know that there is some function h, which is smooth up to the boundary. And all of this rational stuff from the previous slide on the boundary has to align with that function h. And now solve for w bar. Uh, you can almost do that at a glance. But in any case, the point is, if you solve for w bar, then you've got a boundary formula, which makes w bar meromorphic because capital H was holomorphic. And that means that your domain, at least the omega complement, was a quadrature domain because we just found a meromorphic Schwartz function. 
So there are some things to be careful of, making sure that poles don't go on the boundary or other strange things like that. But you can track that down, and it really does work. And even better than that, if you use the argument principle, you can count how many poles that Schwartz function is going to have. And in this case, it turns out to be exactly two. And I'll kind of quickly run through why. Uh, if you were to look at 1 over w plus 1 over w bar, first plug in s, because s equals w bar on the boundary. And that'll have two poles, because it was equal to the sum of two Cauchy kernels. And that means w plus 1 over s would have two roots. And now plug back in for w bar and rearrange a little, and you can tell what the winding number is going to be. You get positive number over w bar. And so take zeros minus poles equals winding, and you can get yourself through the algebra, if you do it the right way, to fall out that this original function having two poles also forces s to have two poles. And that means that you have a quadrature domain with two nodes, which is a Neumann oval. And because I was assuming that I had connectedness and simple connectedness, which means it's not two disjoint disks, it's a merger, which was a Neumann oval. And so without too much extra trouble, you can tack on extra point charges and you'll get the exact same conclusion. If you have a set of n point charges, uh, then you'll get a quadrature domain in the plane after stereographic projection with n nodes. And everything goes through beautifully, except for what I mentioned at the beginning. That's a very nice and elegant approach, which is kind of pleasing, especially to a complex person like me. But you are relying on some boundary smoothness, for example, to get Stokes's theorem, to get the Schwartz function, et cetera. And it also becomes awkward when the complement of the equilibrium support is disconnected. You can actually still take care of that second part uh, without, I mean, a huge amount of trouble, but it gets very awkward. And both of those weaknesses you can get around, actually. The connectedness uh, you can handle by balayage. So if you express the equilibrium measure in terms of a balayage problem, uh, as maybe partial balayage in steps. If you have two disconnected regions of charge exclusion, maybe they're each determined by some subset of the number of point charges, uh, then it turns out they don't interact with each other. You can look at each of those components separately, and the final result will just be the union of those. Uh, and the boundary smoothness is a little bit more of a problem, but Thankfully, uh, other people had published uh, a paper, Hedenmalm and Makarov had a result which helped us uh, get over that a priori assumption of smoothness. And the relevant result is that in this situation, uh, the Laplacian of the external field is going to give you the density of the equilibrium measure throughout the support, regardless of how bad the boundary is. And so what that allows you to do is go back to the Frostman condi condition and work with it directly at the expense of getting statements that are true in a weak sense. All right, so you can get boundary information that's weakly holomorphic, but by Weyl's lemma, weakly holomorphic means holomorphic. And so you get maybe a weak Schwartz function, which then ends up being an actual legitimate Schwartz function because of Weyl's lemma. And now you're back to a quadrature domain again, and you can again use the quadrature, uh, excuse me, the uh, argument principle to count the quadrature nodes. And at this point, I'll mention there are other approaches to this type of problem. Uh, Arno Coilars and Juan Crado del Rey have studied the same problem with like vector equilibrium problems uh, in the case of two symmetric charges and in the case of several symmetrically positioned and equal charges. And I think Arno even gave a talk maybe a couple months ago to this webinar on, on their approach to the problem. Uh, I will say they have nice kind of exact analysis for the case of two symmetric charges and this technique that I'm showing now can also get results that are exact 
at least in that restricted two symmetric charge case by conformal mapping. Uh, so the quadrature domain approach would involve knowing that your result is a Neumann oval. So now use that conformal map that I showed several minutes ago, a rational function, uh, and then try to figure out what the relationship is between the mapping parameters and the original data from the sphere. And that relationship turns out to be exactly solvable for symmetric charges. Uh, for two asymmetric charges, it's still kind of doable, but kind of horrific and ugly. So you want to approximate it. But in principle, you can still handle uh, an exact solution for two charges using conformal mapping. And a useful tool or a shortcut, if you want, a uh, shortcut for me, maybe fundamental for other approaches, would be the spherical Schwartz function, which is s over 1 plus z times s. So what that does is it incorporates uh, the usual Schwartz function into the stereographically distorted spherical area measure on the plane, which involved a z bar over 1 plus norm z squared. So I just sub in s for z bar. And that kind of allows you to analyze the spherical quadrature data uh, directly. And so I'm going to finish off with a couple examples worked out. So these would appear in detail in the paper that I published on this, what I think will be in the link uh, to the talk. And so I, these are weird numbers, of course, because I rigged the numbers to make the picture look nice. But uh, these are exact. Uh, solutions in this case, if you take two equal charges of uh, that strange intensity at those two strange points on the sphere, then I've given us the original picture on the sphere and its stereographic projection. So these diamonds are the point charges. The dotted circles on the sphere are the individual caps of influence, or what the charge exclusion would be if you deleted one point or the other. And they merge together into this nice shape. So above that black curve would be the equilibrium support. And in the plane, same story, except I've got two sets of nodes. I'm showing, first of all, the black diamonds filled in here. These are the quadrature nodes with respect to flat Lebesgue area measure. And one way to interpret what's going on here is this Neumann oval is a quadrature domain with respect to two different measures at the same time. It's a quadrature domain with planar measure and spherical measure on the plane. And the spherical measure has its nodes at these asterisks, right? which makes sense because the spherical uh, area density counts further out distance less in the plane. So these nodes get brought in a little bit. Here's an asymmetric case. I've got two charges at slightly off-kilter locations and very different intensities. And uh, the stereographic projection, in this case, is a pretty sharp Neumann oval. And again, I've got the black diamonds being area measure and the asterisk being spherical area measure in the plane. And again, just by stereographic projection, you can map these two kinds of quadrature domain one onto the other. And just for fun, I've got some three and four point configurations. Now you may notice kind of a pattern here, which is everything is nice and simply connected. Uh, in these images, the red is, in this case, the stereographic projection. I got crazy with the colors here. I don't remember why I did that. But uh, these charge exclusion regions are simply connected because that's what I can do with conformal mapping. For non-simply connected cases, you can parameterize quadrature domains, but it's a much bigger hassle. There's something called a Schottky-Klein prime function that shows up in, for example, fluid dynamics that can tell you exactly how these quadrature domains go in the non-simply connected case. I think I'll finish with some further questions. And the first one's inspired by Arno and Juan's approach to the problem. So I now know that the charge exclusion region has a quadrature domain property, but is there maybe a kind of dual property on the actual equilibrium support? So is there an electrostatic skeleton or mother body uh, where you could maybe balayage all of the charge and 
and get it onto uh, instead of a quadrature node set, a mother body. And I believe Arno and Juan's approach to the equal two charge case, in fact, does use that. They find a mother body for the equilibrium support, which turns into a Neumann oval. Uh, also, what happens on other manifolds? Can you do the potential theory on other strange looking surfaces? And if so, what might happen? What happens for other potentials? That's another exciting kind of question. For example, to make it purely physical, you might try the Coulomb potential on S2 and try to figure out what happens. And for that matter, why not try higher dimension, which is getting into some really unknown territory because quadrature domains are not very well understood at all in higher dimensions. Uh, in holomorphic function theory, there are some results, but real potential theoretic quadrature domains in higher dimension, uh, for example, a two-point quadrature domain I don't think is even known explicitly what they look like. Uh, and of course, if you're in odd dimension, for example, I'm sure the complex analysis probably breaks down kind of catastrophically and a lot of these techniques that I use just don't work. So and plenty of room for future development. Uh, and I think I'll leave it there and take your questions if there are any. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Alan. Fascinating talk. Shows you just how powerful these complex analysis tools are. Um, so let me invite uh, any questions. Actually, uh, I have a question. Uh, hi, it's Alan, it's Norm. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, it was great, great talk as usual. Um, Actually, this is maybe a more general question about quadrature domains, showing my ignorance of it. But so you said, so when you projected these regions to quadrature, you get quadrature domains in the plane. And you mentioned just a few slides ago that they're actually quadrature domains with respect to two measures, right? The regular area measure and this projected uh, uh, spherical area measure. Uh, and I assume when you say that, you mean quadrature with respect to harmonic functions or Bergman functions, whatever, right? So sure. So my question is, are there, are there possibly other measures for which these are quadrature domains, you know, with, with respect to this class of functions or what do you know about other measures in, in quadrature domains? Uh, so it, that's a good question. Uh, if you were to have an external field, for example, which is a polynomial in norm Z squared, uh, I believe you can write kind of a similar argument and get uh, quadrature domains with respect to weighted measure with some kind of weird rational thing out front. So it can be done and you could phrase some similar problems to, uh, to take that form. In terms of specific examples, I don't know that I have one to recite off the top of my head. Uh, but with Stokes's theorem, it basically has to do with the weight out front. If you take the holomorphic derivative of that, then it should be maybe like rational neuromorphic or something. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> I have a question. Arnold Carlos here. Uh, nice talk, Alan. Um, is there, what well, you ha now have correct, you, you should, did you, Am I right that you proved that any uh, Neumann oval in the plane arises from the projection uh, of, uh, of this uh, complement of, of the droplet on the sphere? Or is it not uh, like that? Um, I, believe, I believe that's true. And I, in a proof off the top of my head, I don't know. But yeah, I think you should find some kind of correspondence between the planar ones and the spherical ones. And and and, in, and if you have higher, this is this this is for two points, right, on the sphere. Mm -hmm. If you go to uh, an, uh, any number of points, right, you you get, you find these quadrature domains. But do you find all of them, or is there a subclass of domains that you find? Uh, I, is there I say about that. I believe. In this particular problem, you're going to find a subclass if you maybe go to three points or more, because 
uh, quadrature domains with multiple points end up not being unique necessarily. So there ends up being, for non-simply connected ones, kind of a class of domains that satisfy the same identity. And I think there's a there are papers by Gustafsson, I believe, that talk about that. Uh, but another another problem would be if we're thinking quadrature domain in general. Uh, in my understanding, that would include things that allow derivatives in the quadrature identity. That can give you uh, shapes with sharp cusps, for instance. Uh, in particular, in a in this problem where you get individual point charges giving you the support, I I believe all of these quadrature domains become subharmonic quadrature domains. Uh, so they also satisfy an inequality for subharmonic functions, which is a more restricted type of domain. But you, it also includes cases where you have derivatives. Is that right or not? Uh, I, I can't really think of that, actually. Uh, uh, from the sphere, I'm not sure that you could reproduce that kind of quadrature domain from this particular problem. But uh, if you're just in the plane, then the cardioid, for example, is a quadrature domain with a single node where you have to evaluate the function and its derivative. Okay, yeah. And I have another question related indeed to the mother body, right? Which has to do with the droplet itself, right? As you know, do you have any, it, it sort of, it, it should be the a branch cut of, of the Schwartz function, right? Essentially, yes. I mean, well, do you have any ideas on that or? Um... Uh, yeah, so I believe it has to do with a quadratic differential uh, Riemann surface. Uh, there is a large paper by uh, Guillermo Silva and uh, Martinez Finkelstein, I think, where they solve like a vector equilibrium problem and they find supports of essentially mother bodies using these quadratic differentials. Uh, so I believe, at least in like a simply connected case, you it would be along those lines. What the analysis would look like exactly, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks. Um, are there any further questions, comments? Okay, so let me maybe just uh, clarify. So uh, uh, what your result specifically is, um, is you can do anything for simply, so I didn't understand, um, they seem to say you can compute, compute um, the, um, uh, the uh, charge-free area uh, explicitly for uh, simple connected uh, uh, domains, but I didn't understand what you said about the multiply connected domains. Is, is it that you can also compute the, um, uh, let's say the, the charge-free the charge free part as well for that case? Uh, I believe in certain cases you could mm -hmm. using this uh, Schottky-Klein prime function, mm -hmm. uh, but in the simply connected case, you can use conformal mapping the obstruction is that the relationship between the Riemann map parameters and the quadrature data on the sphere is mm -hmm. a very complicated relationship, which might not be explicitly solvable. It's just algebraic somehow. So, so you said something about uh, different uh, connected components splitting apart somehow. Uh, right, so for example, in the case of maybe four points mm -hmm. and they're paired up yeah, yeah. Two, okay mm -hmm. very close and they each determine a Neumann oval and those Neumann ovals don't you can compute them. yeah uh, so th this case you can handle right okay I got you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's the more complicated case when it's somehow a few points together and then there is some uh, uh, okay. high okay. connectivity uh, okay you could have many points along the equator, maybe, uh, and then you disconnect the. I see. The, mm -hmm. I see. I got you. Okay. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So if there are no further uh, comments or questions on the record, I guess we can stop recording and check if there are any informal comments.